In March 2003, the invasion of Iraq began. Ostensibly part of the war on terror that followed the attack on New York's Twin Towers, a US-led coalition assembled by President George W. Bush sought to depose Iraq's president, Saddam Hussein, on the false claim he possessed so-called weapons of mass destruction. America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. Saddam resisted the coalition advance, but there was an inevitability to his defeat and the thousands of deaths, military and civilian, that it took to topple him. Baghdad fell on the 9th of April. Yes, he's coming down. He's beginning to bow. He's over. A moment in history for the people of Iraq, the uh, statue of a man that has ruled the country <laughs> for 35 years. Yet Saddam himself was captured much later, in December of that year, found cowering in a hole by American forces. A war crimes trial followed in 2004, at the conclusion of which he was sentenced to death. <laughs> Down with the traitors in Baghdad, he screams. Long live the Iraqi people. He was later hanged. On this edition of The Daily, I've been speaking to one of the 12 US soldiers who, for six months, were tasked not just with ensuring Saddam's imprisonment, but also his protection. They lived with him, ate with him, played chess with him, shared stories of their lives with him. We could hear the, the bones creaking and the deep, heavy sighs when, you know, he's rolling out of bed in the morning. Specialist Adam Rogerson was just 22 years old when given this assignment. He'd signed up to serve his country in the aftermath of 9-11. Unable to tell anyone for many years, he first spoke about his experience in the book The Prisoner in His Palace, which was the first time the guards were publicly referred to as the Super 12. And as you're about to hear, Adam remains conflicted about that time. He knew of Saddam's horrific crimes, that he'd killed tens of thousands of his own people. And yet Adam and the others that guarded him formed a relationship with Saddam even had affection for him. That that was even possible will surely perplex or perhaps horrify many of you, as I confess it did me at times. But 20 years on from the invasion of Iraq, this is Adam's story. I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome to the Sky News Daily. The first time I had interaction with him was the night we took over the mission and that was at the Iraqi High Tribunal Court. I was told, you'll be the first one on guard. And it was very intimidating for me. I can't really describe the emotions that are going through your body. And once I got to his cell um, to hear him sleeping, and when he woke up, he looked over, he knew that it was no longer the previous guards. It was new people watching him. And it was sort of one of those things. He looked at me. I looked at him. It was the start of our relationship, I, I would say. It was a stare off. A stare off, as in literally staring into each other's eyes. I mean, you, you, were, you were quite a young man at the time, as I understand it, 22, and you were given the job of guarding what was the then president's public enemy number one. How did you feel? when you were handed this particular assignment? We weren't happy because no one wants to be in Iraq doing what we were doing. So I think the initial thoughts that run through everyone's mind is wanting to take him out. When you say take him out, I mean, kill him. I mean, you were at war at that point, weren't you? Yeah. Describe the, the, the physical reality of this place in which you, you had these interactions with Saddam. Living with him and interacting with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, going to different places with him. We could hear mortars going off. We can hear gunfire. We can hear all the sounds of war. He would look and laugh. He didn't show any signs of worry at all. On more than one occasion, he would look over and say, 
I'm getting out. They're coming to get me. Presumably, though, you, you had been instructed, you and the rest of what became known as the Super 12. I mean, you had been told not to interact with him whilst you were whilst you were you were responsible for him i mean how long did that last didn't last long because he was a i mean he's a people person whether it was him maybe trying to manipulate us or be friends with us i mean if you're living with someone and you see him every day you're gonna interact with them not only did we live with him, but I mean, you get up close and personal with someone. If he was going to the bathroom, we were there. If he was taking a shower, we were there. If he was eating, enjoying smoking a cigar, we were there. So you go into this mission thinking bad things, horrible things. And then once you realize that it's bigger than you and your job is to care for him, not only guard him, guarding is only one part of it and making sure no one harms him. And that that's just, that's the easy part. The hard part is forming that relationship. And some people just fit together. And though he was a maniacal dictator, an evil person, we had to see the other side of him. And when he was around me, especially, I got to see the 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 man the sensitive side of him because we had no choice he got to see the sensitive side of me and i think personally we were very comfortable around each other you mentioned a moment ago you know his his love of cigars i mean such was the relationship between the two of you that he as i understand it told you the story of who taught him to smoke his cigars yeah one night we were just in the his little rec area and he was smoking a cigar, and what he liked to do is he had a little uh, space heater. He had his chair. He had a photo book. And we're sitting there just letting him do his thing. He, he was listening to the radio. It was a very calm night. You could hear a little bit of art artillery here and there, but nothing too crazy. And as he was smoking a cigar and he was looking at this photo book, I was just watching him. And then he began to tell me as he was smoking his cigar, Hey, come here, look at these pictures. And I walked over and I, you know, it was an old photo album and I'm looking and I was like, is that Fidel Castro? <laughs> and they're just in these pictures, motoring around one of his lakes, fishing, having a good old time. And uh, that's where he told me how he started smoking cigars. They were buddies. I wonder, given there was, there was clearly a, a bond developing, between between the two of you, I mean, to to what extent did you open up then about your your personal life and and I wonder if any of the others did the same. Yeah, I mean, we would trade stories back and forth. And number one, it helped pass the time. And number two, you got to see a side of him that you didn't know, which was interesting for him to talk about his family because we would take him to go see his family and they would bring him gifts and candy. He would share with me, you know, his stories and whatever he would get, he would always share, whether it be nuts, candy, whatever it is, here, do you want some? So then we started trading stuff from our families. My wife would send these candles and I told him, hey, man, my wife sent me these candles. Do you want one? And he said, sure. And I brought him one in there and he would carve a poem or, you know, uh, let's say a, a Bible verse on it. And when we would take him to see his family, that was his gift to them. Mind you, we weren't supposed to have these interactions, but we did. This is the thing. I think a couple of the others from the Super 12 were playing chess with him. You, you know, you sat, listened to music with him. You looked through his photo albums, even the ones including Fidel Castro. You, you told him stories about your own private life. It seems to me like there was perhaps almost a paternal or maybe even a, a kind of a grandfatherly nature to this man in your eyes. That's one of the main things that I wanted to drive home. Whenever I tell people about this mission is... You have to understand that when you're willing to lay your life down for someone and you know that it's a real possibility, 
I got to see a side of him that was, um, like I said, it wasn't evil, mm -hmm. even though I knew he was. He never showed me that side. I only saw the 69-year-old man. You know what I'm saying? So not being around your family, you sort of begin to, de to develop those feelings of who he is right now. Whether he was sorry for what he did or not, he never came off as arrogant or as a dictator to me. He just came off as a person. But at the time, I was also a, a, a kid. I, I was 22. So whether it was him manipulating a situation, I don't know. But I always felt if something ever happened and we had to fight, he, I always thought that he wouldn't have hurt me. I understand. Orders, orders are orders. You would have been willing to lay down your life so that you know, Saddam Hussein would live and see justice. I wouldn't have given it a second thought. I, I wonder now, because obviously... Whilst, whilst you were guarding him, this, this process of the tribunal was, was, was going on. I mean, did Saddam ever get the, give the impression that he knew how things were, were likely to end, that, that, that a death sentence was, was a, a very strong possibility? I'm not really sure what he thought, and, but I, I do think that he, he got it and he knew that it was going to happen at some point in time there was a lot there was some betrayal when we knew that the courts were going to put out this verdict in order for him not to know because it was going to be uh, a risk if someone was trying to come get him and to avoid that conflict uh, if anything would have came out on the radio and he would have known, it may have been a big problem. So we had him go out to wreck to smoke a cigar. And when he was out there, we took his radio, popped the batteries out, cut the wires, put the batteries back in and put it back where we found it. And when he went in to, to get his radio and realized it was broken, he was upset. He just looked at us and knew that we did it. The fact you used the word betrayal there suggests that, I mean, you, you, felt, you felt pretty bad about it. Yeah. But even then, at that point, we still didn't know what was going to happen or when. But all we knew is, you know, you form this bond with someone and there's a lot of trust going on. And then you have to be, the mission comes first, and that was part of it. We'll be back in just a moment when, I should warn you, we will be discussing Saddam's final hours. Back now to Adam and his memories of Saddam Hussein. A warning, we will immediately be discussing Saddam's execution by hanging. I remember well, seeing the footage from the execution itself shortly afterwards. And it was pretty brutal watching it on a television screen in a newsroom here, the way in which he, he was treated. What, what leaps out at you from that? But just those, those kind of last few minutes of the life of Saddam Hussein that, that you were there for. It was an emotional time, but we were also laser focused when, once we knew what we were doing and we were pre-planning to execute this mission. So there's a level of focus that you have to have because at this point in time if anyone was going to try and get him they were going to get him now mm -hmm. so once we had received the mission and we woke him up and told him to get ready we had we had left him and then started prepping and to watch him you know put on his suit and comb his hair and pace around he knew what was happening. That part was, it was sad to see. But once we touched down near the uh, death house, 
we had to load up into a different vehicle and it was us and him and his interpreter. And before he went in to see the judge and the executioner, just when that vehicle stopped in front of there and you could sort of take a deep breath because we made it, we did it. The mission was almost complete to have him walk down the aisle and thank us and just reach out and touch you and say, you know, thank you. And he's sad and upset and we're all upset ourselves was a feeling that I've never had, but it, it sticks with you as, especially as a young man and you understand what the mission was, but you don't fully understand uh, uh, how this is happening. Uh, it's insane. Mm -hmm. It's like getting to know someone, spending all your time with them, willing to lay your life down for them. And then all of a sudden they're about to die and you know it. How was he in those, those, those final seconds? With us, he was sad, mm -hmm. but you have to understand he, with us, he was an old man. When he entered, when he popped out of an elevator or walked through a doorway, he was the dictator. So he let his guard down with us so we could hear the, the bones creaking and the deep, heavy sighs when, you know, he's rolling out of bed in the morning. But when he was in front of his peers or he was in front of anyone else, he was stoic, solid, and command the room, no matter what the circumstance was. I raised my hand to serve my country, no matter what the circumstance was. Um, so I don't regret it. I wish maybe I would have been that stoic presence that, that he was when I was with him. Now that I look back at it and I'm older and I'm almost 40 years old, I learned that from him. Mm -hmm. And, but when you're 22, you, you're still, you're, you're I was still a kid and I was looking for that validation and he would give it to me because he, he knew I was a kid. And now I, I, I don't regret it. What are your thoughts about the man now and the relationship that you had? It's two different sides for what he did to the to the Iraqi people and the death and destruction that he caused the punishment fit the crime you did this now you have to pay for it the other side of it is I got to know the older version of him when he let his guard down and I let mind down and we were just people and we could sort of forget about what he did in those times but i i it's so sad but i i think he did deserve it but like i said i was such a young man i didn't under i didn't understand i've you see this stuff in movies and it was my real life Here in the United States, you know, this was a secret that couldn't be talked about for 10 years. I couldn't tell my wife. I couldn't tell anybody. I just sort of had to live with this. One day, I want my family and my kids and my grandkids to know that I did something for my country. It makes it worth it, even though I struggle. And that's it for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you next time.